Our story opens with 12 brothers. That's right, 12. Their dad is Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. You know, the father Abraham had many sons. That guy. Anyway, number 11 out of Jacob's 12 sons, this dude, his name is Joseph. Now, for all you moms and dads out there, I know you don't have favorites, but Jacob does. He loves Joseph the most, and everybody knows it. He even gives Joseph this flashy, colorful coat just to rub it in all their faces. Well, that ticks off the other brothers enough that they start planning to kill Joseph. Yikes! They are dead set on showing their pipe-dreaming brother he's not as special as everyone says. Certainly not special enough to fulfill whatever fancy purpose he thinks God's calling him to. Then Joseph's brothers decide, hey, you know what'll really teach that little punk a lesson? If we sell him into slavery. And so Joseph gets hauled off to Egypt. At this point, you gotta wonder if Joseph thinks any other surprises might be coming his way. I mean, what else could possibly go wrong? Yeah, about that. Joseph becomes a servant in the house of a guy named Potiphar, and Potiphar's wife accuses Joseph of some pretty risque stuff. So Joseph ends up in prison. Looks like Joseph's situation has gone from bad to worse. You certainly couldn't blame Joseph for feeling forgotten or like there's no way God could still use him to do anything important. But thankfully, Joseph knows God, and God has something special in store. While Joseph's in jail, he gets on the Pharaoh's good side. So Pharaoh sets him free and basically makes him his right-hand man. That's when Egypt starts going through a famine. And guess who comes to buy food? Joseph's brothers who had it out for him. Now, Joseph could easily get his revenge, but he ends up giving his brothers food, forgiveness, and he ultimately saves his entire family. Turns out God did have a big purpose for Joseph's life, even in the midst of some seriously terrible stuff happening. Just listen to what Joseph tells his brothers. You guys planned all this for evil, but God planned it for good, to save people's lives. And that's the same promise God makes all of us today. He will use our stories for good when we begin finding purpose in uncertainty. Welcome everybody to the weekend. I want to start out by a little tease, so I hope you're ready for this. I want you to tell me rhetorically what you would be thinking if I said to you that tomorrow at noon at the In Pray Worship Center, I am going to give the first 3,000 people who show up $10,000 each. Not monopoly money or play money, but I'm going to literally, out of my own funds, give each of the 3,000 people who show up $10,000 each. Now, if you could speak to me from your home or from the campus, wherever you happen to be right now, I'm guessing you would say, I don't believe you. It's a gimmick. What are you up to? I don't think you really have $10,000 to give away to 3,000 people. And probably what would happen is that tomorrow at noon, only a few of you would show up, not expecting any money, just to find out what the gimmick is all about because you don't have anything better to do. But now I want you to imagine that Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, is standing up here. He's the wealthiest man on earth net worth of $182 billion. And he says to you, I promise you that if you show up tomorrow at noon, the first 3,000 people are going to get $10,000 each from me. Do you know what I think would happen? I think some of you would rush in your cars and get here and camp outside. In fact, I am quite positive we would have to hire security for the next 24 hours in order to keep this place from blowing up, so to speak, with people everywhere and fighting to get in here. Now, what's the difference between me saying, I promise you $10,000 tomorrow, and Jeff Bezos saying, I promise you $10,000 tomorrow? The answer to the question is capacity, capacity you know that he can make good on his promise. You doubt whether I can make good on my promise. And even if I had the money, you know I'm Dutch. You'd have to pry it out of my hands, right? But you know that Jeff Bezos can easily pay off everybody 
$10,000 each. Well, I want you to know this weekend, as we've been looking at the life of Joseph, we have discovered that God has the capacity to make good on his promises. I love this passage. It comes out of Hebrews chapter 6, and it says in verse 18, So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Then he says, therefore, or based on this, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. And he's talking to believers, some who are undergoing a lot of persecution. And he's saying to them, even though you're being afflicted by persecution and even though the devil is after you, I want you to know that you can trust God as your refuge. God is going to make good on his promise. There is a future that's ahead of us that lies before us where we know someday we're going to be with him. And someday he's actually going to defeat evil completely and establish his rule and reign on this earth. And so what the writer is saying is because of God's capacity to produce on his promises, we can have this faith, we can have this trust in God that he's going to make good. You know, I like this saying about God and how he works, even in the midst of difficulties and in the evil world. It goes like this. God often allows himself to be put into impossible situations in order to bring about his will. And that's so true. From Genesis to Revelation to this very day, Sometimes you look at a situation, you just go, this looks so impossible. How's it ever going to work out? And God has his ways of making things happen, even when it seems impossible. And the whole narrative of Joseph and his family is proof of that, of how God shows up and how God works things out though the odds look impossible. Remember the promise that God made to Joseph's great-grandfather, Abraham, God said in Genesis chapter 12, he said, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others, a, a, a far reach out to when Jesus would come because it is through Christ who comes to the seed of Judah, who comes from Abraham ultimately, that we find our salvation and that hope is brought to this world. But as we've looked at Jacob's family, starting from Abraham onward, my goodness, talk about a dysfunctional family throughout all of their history. Talk about every form of sin, every form of hindrance that could be possible. I mean, from a human perspective, you don't know how on earth they're ever going to become a nation, and you have no idea how they're going to be a blessing to the whole world. But God pulls it off in every case, no matter how impossible or how rebellious and how difficult his people might be. And that is still true today in our lives, your life, my life. Despite all the stuff we deal with, despite this evil world we live in, God has the capacity to make good on his promises. He's a great God. He's a strong God. He's a good God. And so that's what leads Joseph to this conclusion that we're going to look at in chapter 45 and verse 8. See, he kind of reflects on his own life, and he's now talking to his brothers. He's revealed himself to them. He says these words. He says to them, so it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all Egypt. It's as though Joseph is saying, look, you guys meant harm toward me. You behaved wickedly toward me. I've endured a lot of evil at the hands of Potiphar's wife who falsely accused me of raping her. I was a forgotten prisoner. But in all of that, I believed in the promises and the providence of God. I knew that God would make good on those dreams that he gave me. I knew that God had a plan. So it didn't matter what I was going through. I just knew that no matter how much evil was coming at me, no matter how impossible it looked, God was going to work things out. I want to ask you a question. 
Do you have that same conviction? I've been asking myself that too. Do we as a church have that same conviction that no matter how challenging our lives become or our culture becomes, do we believe that God is in control? That God is working out his will, even if I don't understand how it's all going to work out. I think it is so very important that in the day and age that we're living in, that we wrap our minds and our hearts around that very significant truth. Because there's a, a lot of evil coming our way. I mean, it's been around forever, right? Ever since the garden, human beings rebelled. But you feel its intensity, particularly in our society today, where there's so much loud, outspoken desire to cancel, right? To cancel the existence of God, to cancel the veracity of Scripture, the truth, the fact that it's truth, to cancel moral absolutes that the Bible speaks of, to cancel Jesus being the only means of salvation, that he is the Son of God, that he was born, he lived, he died, he was buried, he rose again, that he offers eternal life to any who will put their faith and trust in him alone, that he imparts a spirit to us, that he's ascended to the Father, and he's coming back again. In a world that wants to cancel all of that, in a world that wants to challenge that, in a world that wants us to compromise that, as we feel the pressure of that, are we willing to believe and trust that despite all the evil that's going on around us, hey, and be honest, sometimes even in us, our own sinful nature, do we believe that God is carrying out his purpose, that God is going to accomplish his divine will around us and in us? and in his church. I came across an article recently that kind of uh, emphasizes what I'm saying. It was actually uh, appeared in the LA Times and it was written by a secularist, uh, Phil Zuckerman. And uh, in it, he was uh, referring to this Gallup poll that just recently came out that says that the decline in, uh, in churches is on the increase, that there are less and less and less people who are going to church. And he says, this is just great news. In fact, I've uh, got a little uh, quote uh, by him in which he says, it is good news to know that religion is on the decline in America. It's to be welcomed and it's to be embraced. <laughs> I read that and I thought to myself, wow. What a negative attitude and what a misconstrued statement to make because while mainline denominations are declining in attendance, the truth is churches that are truly on fire for Christ are actually growing and gaining. God is at work. But nonetheless, nonetheless, we feel the winds blowing against us. And we've got to understand how is God working in all of this? Someone who's helped me understand uh, how God works when evil is truly present and when evil is working so hard is uh, a preacher who lived 185 years ago, Charles Simeon. He was a great leader, a great mentor, a prolific preacher. And his comments on this story of Joseph are so insightful to see how God works. And I thought it'd be so helpful for you and me today to think through some of these things together. So here's what I think we need to know about how God works in the midst of an evil world. First principle is simply this. We need to know that while God is never a partaker in the actions of evil people, he can accomplish his purposes through their activities. We live in an evil world. We're all sinful human beings. We're all going to act out of our sinfulness. It doesn't handcuff God. Well, God doesn't cause or partake in that evil and that sinfulness. God can still take those actions and work out his purposes. And the story of Joseph just displays that all over the place. I don't have to say a whole lot about that. We just look at the life of Joseph and we see how God took all the evil that was intended by the various individuals and worked out his will. See, human beings have inclinations and they act on their own inclinations. Sometimes there are good inclinations. A lot of times there are bad inclinations. It doesn't limit God 
from being able to still carry out his purpose and his will. So you might be experiencing some things in your life, in your home, in your family, at work, where you know people are behaving badly, and you're kind of suffering the consequences of that, like Joseph did. Don't think that God is absent. Don't think that God can't work in your life and bring about his purpose in your life. Like Joseph, you might have to be patient. I might have to be patient. We might have to be patient. God is at work. God is in control. Let's look at our second principle. Know that God allows people to reveal what is in their hearts. Know that God allows people to reveal what is in their hearts. So we are all sinful human beings. And oftentimes we reveal what's in our heart by things we say and things that we do. And those who do not know Christ in particular and those who are anti-Christ will oftentimes reveal what is going on in their lives. And God allows that to go on display. And oftentimes what triggers that is you and me. And what I mean by that is oftentimes we bring out as believers we bring out the worst in some people because not everybody is for the truth. Not everybody is for God. I thought about those words of Jesus in uh, Luke chapter six, verse 22, where he says, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the son of man. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, look, when they persecute you, understand they persecuted me first. And they're persecuting you because they hate me. And God allows that sometimes to play itself out. But it doesn't mean that God is, in, is not in control. God can even use that action to carry out his will and his purpose. And perhaps some of you are in a situation right now where because you love God and because you are living by his truth, not obnoxiously, I hope, not getting in people's faces. I'm not talking about the bad way many evangelicals have behaved, particularly this past year, and kind of, you know, have brought on what we don't need. I'm talking about when you just simply go about trying to live your life, trying to honor God, trying to live by his truth. You may be facing some flack. You may be facing some real pushback from people, maybe even in your family or outside your family. And God allows that to happen. And God can even take that and use it to bring about his divine purposes and good. So don't get discouraged and don't give up as you face that at work, in your family, in the neighborhood, or in the culture in general. Don't let it beat you down. God knows what he's doing. That leads us to a third principle. God knows, or we should know that God allows Satan to instigate evil in the hearts of humans. God allows that to happen. I'm not saying that God makes them evil. Instigate simply is like a catalyst. It's like God allows Satan to come along and, and he allows Satan to mobilize people, to, to tempt them, to encourage them, to fan the flames of their evil actions. And while that's hard to sometimes understand, it's nonetheless the reality. God allowed the brothers to beat up Joseph and throw him in a pit. God allowed Potiphar's wife to act on her inclinations and try to tempt Joseph. God allowed uh, Daniel and the Hebrew children and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to go through the trials that they went through there in the book of Daniel, and on the list goes. God sometimes allows those things to take place, and he uses what happens to carry out his will and accomplish his divine purposes. You know, there are a couple of scriptures that, that remind us of this action of the evil one and God giving him space and room to do that. Look what Paul, uh, excuse me, Peter wrote to the believers in his little epistle. He says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 
Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are going through as well. Now, the evil one can prowl, okay? But listen, what I'm saying is he still has to have permission to instigate, to be a catalyst to get people to behave in an evil way. Uh, Take, for instance, uh, Job. In the story of Job, chapter 1, the Satan is given permission to afflict Job by God himself, but to a certain limited degree. Or take Jesus. When Jesus is standing on trial before Pilate, Pilate says, don't you realize I have the authority to release you? And Jesus says, you'd have no authority except that which is granted to you. Or in Luke 22, Jesus looks at Peter. He says, Satan has sought permission to sift you like wheat, but I've interceded. I've interposed myself for you. And Peter, when you do fail me, because you are going to, repent and come back and encourage your brothers. I've made a way back for you. So it's hard for us to sometimes grasp and understand that. But God has his ways of working out his will by even allow Satan to sometimes fan the flames of evil. Dr. Ray Pritchard has this great uh, comment about this. I want to read it to you. He says, Satan operates within limits imposed by God. This is both a comfort and a warning. It's a comfort to know that our temptations do not happen by chance, but are permitted by our Heavenly Father. The warning is that God still holds us accountable for how we respond, no one can ever say, the devil made me sin. He can set up the scenario. He can encourage it. But we have to make the choice. And even then, God is still able to work. Which takes us to another principle. And that is, we need to know that when God removes his restraining grace, things fall apart quickly. When God removes his restraining grace, things fall apart quickly. And a beautiful illustration of this in the text is when Joseph leaves the protection of his father to go find his brothers. When the brothers realize that daddy's nowhere around, they are just, you know, free to attack Joseph and mistreat him and throw him in the pit. And on the story goes. You know, when God, when God, pulls back, so to speak, his restraint. Evil will always fill the vacuum. What's interesting is that oftentimes this is how God punishes sin. In Romans chapter 1, you know, Paul talks there about how when people reject God and rebel against him continuously, that God sometimes then just steps back from them and simply lets them have their way. I believe that hell is is God abandoning humanity to itself. And I, I believe that punishment and judgment is when God gives us over to ourselves. And there's no doubt in my mind that as a nation that has claimed itself to live by, you know, to have its government, its rules by the authority of God's word. As we reject God, as we reject those, those truths, we're experiencing punishment. Because we've chosen that. And God gives us over to what we want. But you know, there's an interesting passage of scripture that says that judgment begins with the house of God. And I can't help but wonder if the church is undergoing some punishment and discipline from God because we've tried to politically make things right. We've tried through other venues, through money or through plans or through programs to turn the world around, and we've forgotten that only Christ can turn the world around. And we can't politicize Jesus. We can't politicize the gospel. We can only witness to it. We can only live it out and demonstrate it in our lives. And Jesus says the way we do that is not by being mean and aggressive and angry. And to fight with each other and to fight with others. Throughout the gospel, Jesus emphasizes, 
Love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. If you love each other. And if you even love those who be your enemies. That's one of the ways that God dealt with his people sometimes. To get their attention, to humble them. He, he just pulled back his restraint and let them fall into the hands of their enemies to wake them up. And perhaps this is the time when God is saying to his church, particularly in this country, wake up. I'm going to pull back. I'm going to let you experience what it's like when you don't trust me, when you don't do things my way. Some passages of scripture remind me of how God did that with his own people. Come out of, for instance, Psalm 81, verse 11. It says, but no, my people wouldn't listen. Israel did not want me around, so I let them follow their own stubborn desires, living according to their own ideas. Or Psalm 106, he says, God handed them over to pagan nations. They were ruled by those who hated them. And, and on the scriptures go. Where God does this sometimes. I don't know if that's what God is doing with the church today. But I can't help but wonder. And that's why we need a spiritual awakening within the church of Christ. That's what I'm praying for for myself. So I'm praying for for our church and our community. That we be revived, that we get out of this lull, out of this, this um, the doldrum, spiritual doldrum, so to speak. That we stop being apathetic, that we get on fire for Christ, for holiness in our lives, and a deep love for the world that's around us. It's the only way, it's the only hope things are ever going to be turned around again. All right, so those are some of the things that we need to know about God. Now, knowing that about God, what does that enable us to be able to do? Let's talk about that. Number one, it enables a person to be strong in their faith and endurance. If I know that God's in control, if I know that God can interpose himself, intervene in situations that God can allow certain things to happen and have a purpose for that, then I know the stuff that's happening around me, whether it's in my family or in my job or in my society, I know that God's using that to transform my life. He's using that to build perseverance in my life. He's using that to build faith in my life, endurance in my life, trust in my life, trust of him. Secondly, it enables you to know that your trials are not by accident. God has a purpose. I love that passage, by the way, here in Peter, because Peter says to the believers, he says, listen, as you watch the stuff that's going on around you, don't stand there and look at it like this is really strange. Of course, your followers are Christ. He's saying you are going to suffer for Christ, and you're going to suffer with Christ. Don't be startled by what's happening to you. It comes with the territory. And I can hear Peter kind of saying that to me and to you as well. Don't be surprised. But understand, God does know what he's doing. Number three, it enables you to be a witness to the presence and power of Christ. This passage here in Acts chapter 5 talks about when the disciples, the apostles, were, were beaten, were flogged for bearing witness to Christ by the religious rulers. And it says, after they were flogged, that they rejoiced, they were happy that they could suffer for Christ, that they could be a testimony for Jesus. Recently, I was down in Florida visiting my dad, and... Um, while I was there, I met um, some friends of my dad that have been through tremendous trials and could have every reason to be bitter and angry. They happened to be the family of my dad's pastor down there. My dad's pastor died very young of, of a, a terrible cancer that took his life. And around the same time, his oldest son, the pastor's oldest son, was killed in a tragic car accident. And it just devastated the whole family. The wife, the kids, the grandkids. The, the son who died left a wife and three beautiful children. But I had a chance to uh, see some of the family. 
And you know what? They weren't grimacing. They weren't walking around with frowns. They had smiles on their faces. And as we talked a little bit about some of the things that happened, they kept saying to me, as hard as it was, we know that God is in control. As hard as it has been, we know that God's working out his will. And we're good with that. And as I listened to them, I was bolstered in my own faith. I thought, you really have to know God to arrive at that kind of an attitude, that kind of a spirit that says, despite all these hardships that have happened, these difficult things that have taken place, we know that God's in control. We trust that God is working out his will and God has a purpose for this in all of our lives. And I walked away from that feeling as though they were the teachers and I was a student and I've got a lot to learn as a result of that lesson that they taught me just recently again about how God works. I came across a, a rather large quote I want to share with you by um, somebody that we're all very familiar with. He wrote Amazing Grace. Um, he was a slave trader converted to Christ. Yeah, I'm talking about Newton. Listen to what he said. Some Christians are called to endure a, dispro a disproportionate amount of suffering. Maybe that's you, maybe it's somebody you know. He says, such Christians are a spectacle of grace to the church, like flaming bushes unconsumed. And they cause us to ask, like Moses, why is the bush not burned up? The strength and stability of these believers can be explained only by the miracle of God's sustaining grace. The God who sustains Christians in unceasing pain is the same God with the same grace who sustains me in my smaller sufferings. We marvel at God's persevering grace and grow in our confidence in him as he governs our lives. Can you say that? Can you feel that? Can you believe in God's capacity so much that no matter what's going on in your life right now, you believe that God knows what he's doing? No matter the injustice that you might be suffering, you know that God can bring a good end out of it, that God is in control. We need to wrap our minds and hearts around this important, especially in these days. Let's look at another principle, and that is simply this. It enables you to see God where others see evil. And that's the amazing thing about Joseph's story. He always seemed to see God in the pit, as a slave in the household, unjustly treated in the prison. When his brothers finally show up, he just sees God at work all the time. God is here. God knows what he's doing. He focuses more on God and less on the evil, less on the problem, less on the challenges that he's facing. And I guess my question for you is, as you look around your life, as you look around the world right now, I'm guessing that many of you, like me, are more prone to see what's wrong and to see the evil that's mounting. And we need to see the grace of God, the power of God as well. And I love that story where Elisha the prophet and his young servant are surrounded by the enemy. And the young servant is in despair and he says to Elisha, he says, what are we going to do? Look at the enemy. It's all, they're all around us. And Elisha is like totally calm. <clears throat> and he says, yeah, I see them. But don't you see who else is around us? And then he prays. He says, open his eyes up, God. And all of a sudden, this servant has supernatural vision, and he sees surrounding that army a far greater army of horses and fiery chariots, the army of God. And all of a sudden, the whole perspective changes. As God blinds that human army, and Elisha leads them away into an interesting situation that you can read about later. But I was thinking to myself, who and what are you looking at right now? Who and what do you see? Our tendency is to see outside of ourselves. And I'm not saying we shouldn't. But have you ever taken a look inside of you? As a believer, 
Look what's inside of you. Look what John told believers way back when. Look what he said to them. Look at what he said to, to them to look for. First John chapter 4, verse 4, But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. And I'm just going to ask you if you believe that or not. Because if you believe that, it should give you confidence. It should give you hope. It should give you courage. That no matter what you're going through, no matter what is happening in this world, God is in the driver's seat. God, despite evil, despite rebellion, despite rejection, Despite all the cancel, <laughs> you can't cancel God. He can't cancel his divine purpose, his divine will. None of what we're facing these days has caught God by surprise. As he worked things out in Joseph's life for his divine purpose, he's working it out in your life as well. But you know, that brings us to who Joseph ultimately points to with his life. And that is Jesus. Now, have you ever thought about Jesus in his humanity? I mean, think about the evil onslaught that he faced, the injustice that he faced, the hate that he faced that was thrown at him. And in the midst of all of that, Jesus had to believe that his father was in control that his father knew what he was doing as impossible as it must have seemed. And when Jesus was crucified on the cross, hanging there, he had to trust his father that he would raise him again from the dead. And he did. And that's what we just celebrated this past Easter. He is risen why? How? Because his father had the capacity. And he has the capacity to raise you and me up as well. So let's be faithful to him. As we come to our time of communion this weekend, it's a wonderful way for us to remember what Jesus did for us. And not just what Jesus did for us, but to remember how God keeps his promises how he sent the Messiah, how he sent the Savior, and how he raised him back up from the dead as an assurance to you and me that he will raise us up again someday. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion together, I pray and ask, O oh God, that we be mindful that you are the great promise keeper, that you have the capacity, O oh God, to rescue us and you did that to your son, Jesus. And that, God, you have the capacity to take whatever we're facing in our lives and bring it out for a good end that glorifies you. You have the capacity to take the evil that's thrown at us, Lord, and use it if we'll allow you to discipline us and make us more like Jesus, which this world so desperately needs. And so it's in his name that we now celebrate the sacred meal called Holy Communion. In Jesus' name, amen. Hopefully you have some form of communion where you are right now. And if you would just take out that cracker, that bread, whatever it is you have, and that cup of juice, whatever you have there with you, let me remind you that the bread represents the body of Jesus that was given for you and for me. And the Bible says that we should take that bread and we should eat it in remembrance of him. The cup also reminds us of the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. And the Bible teaches us that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. As we drink this, as we ingest it, it kind of washes down into our body. Jesus' blood washes down and washes away the sins in our lives. Let us partake. 
I want to invite you back again next weekend. We finish our series on Joseph. We talk about finding purpose and uncertainty. I have one last principle that you don't want to miss next weekend that will be very helpful to you, especially as you work through challenges in relationships. We're going to be talking about the whole issue of forgiveness. I'll see you next weekend.